Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very ex excited because we have a very special, special guest. He is the amazing Jeff Stanridge, and he is the Managing Director of Innovative Junkie, and he has an excellent topic to talk about today, and it's called Grit and Grace. You're probably saying, what is Grit and Grace? Well, he's going to tell you. He has a lot of experience in the finance business world and he in entrepreneurship and so forth. And he has some great things that he's going to bring up and talk to you about. So put your ears on, listen really carefully because he is amazing. And he wears a lot of hats and he knows a lot of things and he can help you in a lot of areas of business. So I'm going to just give him the stage. Jeff, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Thank you, Stacey. It's a, such a pleasure to be here. So as you said, I serve as Managing Director of Innovation Junkie. And uh, and uh, I, I really uh, grew up in a small town in South Arkansas. I literally graduated high school with 28 people in my public school. Most people, when they say 28 people, it's a private, a private school. But uh, I didn't even know what a private school was. Uh, mm -hmm. I crammed a four-year degree into almost six years uh, because... Uh, uh, academic uh, prowess probably wasn't my strong suit, uh, but I was able to persevere. And uh, when I, I spent about uh, 12 years in healthcare, I actually uh, worked as a medical crew on a helicopter team for Arkansas Children's Hospital for about nine years. And while I was doing that, I became a professor at the University of Arkansas for medical sciences, where I really got interested in the differences between successful, like top 1% performers and average performers, uh, not successful versus unsuccessful. I'm right. talking top, top success versus average success. And, and, uh, uh, that actually led me to complete my doctoral dissertation on that topic and led me to a publicly traded company who wanted me to do the same kind of research for them really kind of threw me into the world of global business. I've worked on five continents. I've been able to take that research and, and do observational research on five continents in multiple countries around the world. And I've distilled that down into a concept that I, that for a long time, I talked about results and relationships. And over the course of the last couple of years, I've been really, really uh, describing that more as the balance between grit and grace. Uh, right. Grit being those relationships, or I'm sorry, those, those, uh, 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 skills, capabilities, and what have you that lead someone to be able to generate consistent results, right. either individually or collectively, and grace or those relationship kinds of skills that enable them to build strong, long-lasting relationships. And so I spend a lot of time with uh, everything from idea stage entrepreneurs to small business leaders to executives of companies, really of, of varying sizes, but probably the sweet spot is somewhere around the 20 to $250 million range. That sounds amazing. Now, when you work from all the way from small businesses to large businesses, correct? That's right. That's right. So everything from from startup companies, uh, uh, tech founders, uh, small business owners, um, and and really, uh, we've worked with with divisions of Fortune One, Fortune Ten, Fortune Fifty types of organizations, where we tend to get the most uh, uh, demand for our work is in that. 10 to 20 million, all the way up to 250 million uh, on, on the innovation junkie side. Uh, if you look at below the $10 million range, all the way down to startup founders, uh, we do that through a, a, a set of third party funded uh, uh, engagements where uh, we have contracts with the U.S. Small Business Administration, the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, and other folks who have a specific interest in growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the state of Arkansas. Now, when COVID came, it caused a lot of problems for a lot of businesses. Now, mm -hmm. let's focus on those small businesses for a minute and up to those $10 million businesses. A lot of companies got hurt. A lot of companies got, you know, that have been here forever. Either That's they right. closed down a lot of, uh, of their shops or they, you know, or they, yeah, they went out of business completely. And for small businesses, a lot of business, you know, um, they, they don't exist anymore or they were hurt really bad financially. And some of them are still working to catch up with themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the common problems that you see right now 
that, you know, because we had a big change. Everybody was going to work back then. Now a lot of people are working from home. We went from one extremity to the next extremity. Mm -hmm. Now, from your own perspective, what are some of the problems that you see, common problems that you see in our business and entrepreneurial world industry? And what are some of the solutions that you have been suggesting and, and implementing yep. to companies and businesses? That's, that, that's a great question. I will tell you that um, uh, originally, uh, in and around the actual pandemic, uh, the single greatest issue that we saw was having virtually zero cash reserves to fall upon, to, to lean upon. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, there was some research that was released right in and around the time of the pandemic that the average small business in the United States had less than 27 days of cash on hand. Oh, so, wow. So less than 27 days. That meant that you know, that they were, that they were, uh, uh, bankrupt almost before the pandemic was two weeks in. Right. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, that's not, that's actually not different than what most households are. You know, the most households cannot incur a $700 unplanned expense without going into debt because they have zero margin or zero cash reserves. And that was one of the single greatest things that led to some 200,000 businesses shuttering their doors forever because yeah. either either they had clients who who uh, stopped coming into their business, or yeah. they had a government who shut them down and they they couldn't they couldn't open for business. And through right. that combination, that was the single greatest issue that we saw. Wow. Now, what were some of the things that some like so for for small businesses, like you said, a lot of them you know didn't even have like twenty seven dollars, and this even happened before the pandemic, you know, and going into pandemic, you know. You know, what are some of the things that you suggest to businesses, whether it's it's a really small business or it's a, a large, you know, for some people, they say a $10 million business is a big business. But when you compare mm -hmm. it to with some of these yeah. other businesses, it's really not, you know, what would you tell these businesses, you know, as suggestions or, you know, some startup solutions to get them to the point where they need to be to get to the point that they were at, you know, when yep. they, they Happens. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, um, you know, we give advice to startup companies that are just getting started and then companies that are already operating. And I'll talk about those a little bit differently. Okay. You know, the, the vast number of startups fail, uh, within five years, you know, the, yeah. they, they, they start their company and, and they just don't get the traction and they fail about 40% of them fail for one single reason. And that is that they create a product or a solution that no one wants, right. or they, 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 rather than falling in love with the business problem they're trying to solve and doing the research to quantify and qualify that business problem before they create their company, they yes. get an idea, they develop a product solution around that idea, they invest their life savings, they mortgage their house, and then they can't figure out why no one will buy their, their, their product or solution. It's because they talk to no one. So, yeah. so we give a lot of advice to entrepreneurs, uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to say, do your customer discovery, yes. forget about the, forget about the solution, forget about your idea, identify the top two or three problems that you're trying to solve, identify the target customer segments that experience those problems to the greatest degree, and then go talk to them. Don't yeah. send them a survey. Don't hand them a flyer and ask them to go to a website. Go actually sit across the table from them and have a conversation with a few very well-planned, open-ended questions called customer discovery questions to yeah. see if without being prompted by you, do they identify the same business problem that you've assumed that they have? And are you accurate in, the, in your assumptions? And so that's that's probably the single greatest piece of advice we give to, to startup founders in making sure that they have product market fit before they actually go and invest their life savings. Right. That's amazing because you know what? I, I've heard that problem so many times and I've heard, seen so many failures and because I've worked with so many companies, you know, startup companies mm -hmm. and that's what they do. They don't talk to people. They, mm -hmm. they go right to the idea they start formulating the idea. They create the product. They're creating their label. They're spending tons of money on marketing. They're putting it out there. And then all of a sudden, they're not getting anything back. You know, That's after right. the expenses are, 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 you know, after the, you pull out your expenses and this and that, they have no profit. And, right. they you know, or the people are just not buying it. And, yeah. and they're, 
it doesn't they, they they're like i don't understand you know everybody likes this product everyone's looking to let's say we'll use lose weight you know so everyone's looking to lose weight i don't understand why they don't want this weight loss product you know but did they talk to people about about it did they find out what people's needs and wants are yeah. you know the people i've spoken with the many people i've spoken to over 100 people they, I have not seen one person, you know, that's had that problem go out and talk to people first before yeah, they. Yeah. No, you're it. right. And, and, and the thing about it is the, the single greatest competitor to a new product or service is the status quo. Yeah. And, and if people aren't willing to change their, their existing behavior, mm -hmm. uh, that's a good issue. And, and I've also found that People who are uh, in a particular industry, they have this curse of knowledge and they think they already know what the market wants. And so they discount the idea of going out and talking to someone because they're afraid someone's going to steal their idea. Yeah. And what they don't understand is there's a difference between a business problem that people will pay to have solved and a nuisance that people would never pay to have, have solved. They'll just gripe about. And yeah. I see so many so many specialist entrepreneurs who are in an industry and start to create a new solution for that industry really don't go out and talk to anyone, but they create a, a product or a service to serve that industry based upon all of their assumptions. And they yes. never really differentiated a true business problem that people would pay to have solved versus a nuisance that just many people will, 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 will gripe and complain about. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. You know, and then when we're I, talking to existing businesses, so so uh, businesses that are beyond the startup phase, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are a variety of things that we talk to them about. You know, they still need to differentiate themselves. They yes. need to know how they how they fare against the competition. Uh, they need to have a unique value proposition uh, and they need to have a plan. Where are they going? You know, it. it it always pains me sometimes, not because businesses are successful, but sometimes they're successful in spite of themselves. They just stumbled onto it accidentally. They never really had a plan. They never really physically managed the business. They literally just stumbled into success. And yes. unfortunately, while I'm happy for them, unfortunately, yeah. it sends the wrong message, reinforces the wrong message to a lot of entrepreneurs who yeah. really don't feel the need to actually have a plan to actually manage their finances, to manage their client acquisition process, to manage their sales and marketing processes, uh, and to to create an actual profitable, fundamentally sound business. Yes, and that's so true because I've worked with so many so many businesses that have done extraordinary, and and when I speak to them and I and I ask them questions and I inquire because I want to learn, I want to mm -hmm. grow, you know. And, I can't tell you the percentage, the high percentage of them that said, just like you said, they just stumbled in. It was mm -hmm. just just being at the right place at the right time, talking to the at right, the right person. Mm -hmm. And and things just just came about. You know, one person liked their idea or one person, you know, gave them a recommendation and boom, they exploded. And That's right. you know, and 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 it, you know, but they never they never planned, like you said. They never plan mm -hmm. for a head. They never, they never broke it down and created a trajectory plan and 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 looked at each section and each category of the business mm -hmm. and how they were going to grow and how they were going to properly, you know, you know, build that part of the business and what problems they might have and then what would be the solution to those problems. None of them sure. did that. That's right. That's right. And and while I'm happy for them, as I said, I would never want yeah. to to uh, criticize someone's success. I'm happy for them. Sure makes it harder to work with other entrepreneurs who feel like that they can do the same thing. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I agree with you, and and that is such great advice, you know. And and you know, I wanted to just tap into those things because I see so many people, you know, struggling, and I see so many mm -hmm. businesses that failed, and I see so many businesses trying to build, and you know the you know. And I know that they look, they're looking for the answers and they keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you went over those things because that's great advice. And I, I think, you know, those are things people really need to keep in mind. And like you said, one of the main things, we have to be willing to change our behavior. You know, right. we have to be willing to change the way we, we think because a lot of people, they're so used to doing things for so long mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they 
they don't realize we're in a different decade. We're in a different generation and yeah. things have to be done differently. Now, you know, um, I want to talk about some of the other things that you do. And I'd like you to like tap into, you know, you you do so many different things. I'd like to focus on, you know, maybe the the um, the innovation of the innovative junkie or, you know, go into I, some of the other businesses that you have and talk a little about that because you tap into different areas and you do different things and all mm -hmm. of them are related to what we just talked about and can help businesses grow. So maybe you can just, you know, tap into something right now. Maybe we'll, we can talk about maybe the Innovative Junkie and sure. some of the things it does. Yeah, so so with Innovation Junkie, we, um, you know, we work with organizations that are a little bigger than your startup founders. And, um, you know, we we come in and and really have a practice offering that revolves around number one, helping them challenge the status quo, helping them to leverage the, the concept of innovation. And so if you define innovation, the way I define it is planned change mm -hmm. that generally is pointed toward either more effective or more efficient ways of doing things mm -hmm. or of doing things in a way that substantially reduces the cost of doing them. So yes. we're, we're, you know, and there, there are three types of innovation. There's, there's incremental innovation, which most companies are pretty familiar with. We call it continuous improvement. We call it process uh, engineering and what have you. And it's basically making small changes over time that can result in pretty massive results on the back end. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, but it's usually uh, incremental from one year to the next. Uh, breakthrough innovation is where we take either a new technology and apply it to an existing business model like um, Uber, for instance. Yeah. So um, uh, taxi cabs had been around for a long time. The business model for taxi cabs had been around for a long time, but we took a new technology and we applied it to, uh, to that business model. Or we take a new business model and we apply it to existing technology like um, Dollar Shave Club, right? Uh, men have been shaving and using facial care products for a long time, and yeah. that technology has existed, but Dollar Shave Club put a new business model around it, a subscription right. model around it. So so that's breakthrough. New technology yeah. with an existing business model or a new business model with existing technology. And then we have really disruptive technology or disruptive innovation where something gets replaced. We actually disrupt the technology. We disrupt the market. We disrupt the business model and something gets replaced. Kind of yeah. like last week, my television cable company came to my house and with me kicking and screaming, they took out all of my cable boxes. Right. <laughs> and so I'm now a completely streaming household. Um, yeah. And so web streaming is probably one of the best examples I can think of of yeah. disruptive innovation. And oh, by the way, generative AI and ultimately predictive AI is going to be the next wave of, of innovative, uh, of, uh, uh, disruptive innovation. And so with Innovation Junkie, we oftentimes start with our organizations to help them look at where do they need to innovate? Do they yeah. need to innovate around technology? Do they need to innovate around internal processes? Do they need to innovate around their business model? From right. there, we focus on helping them create a uh, a strategic, uh, create and implement a strategic growth system. Yes. Strategic planning has a terrible reputation because it is done so badly by so many organizations uh, mm -hmm. where they, they, they figure out this plan. It's going to be, you know, a seven year plan. They, they get it rolled out. They put it on a shelf. It's in a three ring binder that's this thick. And then they forget about it for, you know, a couple of years and they say, oh, let's pull it out and see how we did right. versus having a strategic growth system that answers three major questions. Who are we? Where are we going? And how are we going to get there? And right. creates an actual implementation system, a monitoring system, a, a quarterly review system that actually helps them accomplish that, uh, that where are we going and how are we going to get there uh, yeah. um, as well. And then when we're working with them to actually help them create that strategic growth system, we get, we begin to observe a lot about the culture of the organization. Right. Uh, Peter Drucker said, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And what he means by that is you can have the best laid plans, the best laid structure, strategy, what have you. 
But yes. if you don't have a good positive culture within your organization, it yeah. will literally consume all the positive elements. So we have this concept we call the culture of excellence, which really involves six elements that yes. we're constantly observing the organization for uh, while we're helping them plan and innovate. And during that process, we usually come back to them and say, of these six areas of, of a culture of excellence, here are four of them that we really think we need to help you focus on. Right. Oh, that, you know, that is so true. If you don't have a good culture, if you don't, you know, that we will just eat, eat it up alive. That's now right. we're talking about that. I was thinking to myself, now I've seen so many businesses that had so much potential, but mm -hmm. they, the manager or, or the person in, in charge, the leader, you know, who is the, in charge of that business, you know, whether it's big or it's small, you know, the leadership is so important, you know, Absolutely. And, you know, and your leader is your mentor, your mentor, you know, if people value their, their mentor, they're going to learn from them. They are going to use them as an example, and they will grow together as one big positive culture. Now, what's your thoughts about leadership and what are some of the mistakes you see and, and what are some of the solutions that you implement or you suggest to companies that, you know, offer value? Yeah. So uh, when I talked about those six elements of the culture of excellence, the very yes. first one that I talk about is strong leadership. Mm -hmm. It's the very first one. And as a result, uh, we end up doing quite a lot of executive development, CEO coaching, executive development, and even middle management development around yes. the concepts of leadership. Uh, strong leadership, in, 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 and I actually have a definition of leadership that I use universally that says, Leadership is the most important requirement for business and personal success. In simple terms, it's defined as the willingness to be held accountable for results and then to deliver on that responsibility no matter what the external circumstances, situations, or pressures. And I used to think about that willingness to be held accountable for results. I used to think about leadership as an act of assertion by a leader. In other words, I, as the leader, have to hold myself accountable and I have to hold everyone accountable, I have to go in and hold my people accountable. What I have realized as I've aged over the years is that true leadership is about the willingness to be held accountable by other people and the creation of a culture where my senior executives are willing to be held accountable. Uh, the middle management's being held accountable and they create a culture where everyone else submits themselves to being held accountable. It's a much, right. much better organization when everyone in there is, is willing to submit themselves to accountability. So strong leadership, absolutely tip top of the, of the continuum in terms of creating a culture of excellence. Couldn't agree with you more there. Oh yeah, that, you know, that is so true what you, you have just said. And I think it too is how you, how you portray leadership, because I've seen leaders that, you know, they, they come out and they're just like, they're give, they're banging out the rules and the regulations and what they want to see and their expectations. And here are the goals. And I want to see this in two weeks and this needs to be done. And every, and everybody is getting stressed out, you know, someone might take a handkerchief and, and, and wipe yeah. the sweat their forehead, you know, and, and, you know, there is a way to exemplify positive leadership. Can you maybe give some examples of positive leadership? Because you have people who, you know, exemplify positive leadership and people are willing to work as a team and they don't feel so pressured. And then you have those leaders when they, as soon as they walk in the room, they start to cringe and they, they're starting to mm -hmm. finger, you know, play with their fingers and, you know, they're, they might cross their legs and so forth, you know, so what's your intake about, you know, positive leadership that gets results. Yeah. And, and I can actually share you some of my observations and I can share with you from some of the research as well. Oh, right. Uh, so from, from 1997, uh, uh, even, uh, Coz, Cousy and Posner who wrote the leadership challenge, they created what they call the leadership, uh, uh, practices inventory, the five, four or five major things that they saw from, from leaders that when they asked people, what, what were the things that 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 contributed to your most po your most positive leadership experience? They said honest. My leader was honest, was transparent. Uh, they were forward looking. Uh, they held themselves accountable. Uh, they were inspiring. So they rallied us all around a vision for the company in terms of where we were going, and they made us feel good about it. Uh, yeah. Fast forward to just not too many years ago, McKinsey. 
uh, some of the things that people said, and I'm going to read a couple of these. Uh, they trust you to do the job you've been hired to do. Uh, they seek your advice and input. Uh, they find opportunities to let you shine. They recognize your contributions. Uh, and so, you know, the way I would summarize that is they they take the blame when something goes wrong. They give yeah. credit when uh, when something goes right. And they engage in what I call empowering communication. Now, if we look at the word empower, just the definition of the word empower is to make someone stronger and more confident in dealing with the circumstances that they're facing. So yes. think about that, to make them stronger and more confident. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of disempowering communication that happens in organizations from yes. relatively good leaders, but right. they but they resort to disempowering communication. So if we take that definition, it literally means to make someone weaker and less confident in dealing with the circumstances. Right. So so I like to say that that good leaders not only uh, uh, give the credit and take the blame, but they seek to empower people uh, by making them stronger and more confident in dealing with the daily responsibilities of their job. And they inspire them to accomplish things with other people that they can't achieve uh, by themselves. Right. Oh, that's that's so true. Because there are many times, and this is one of the biggest complaints that I see businesses say, is that I can't find good employees. Like, mm. and you know, and they'll they'll say that you know either they're you know they'll have a X amount of, of responsibilities and they don't meet up to those responsibilities, mm -hmm. or you know they're you know they're supposed to you know, they're supposed to come and show up and do X Y and Z, and they may come in late or they you know or they may give an excuse you know for why something's not done. And, you know, and, and it throws off the whole community, you know, you know, the whole, the, the whole department is thrown off, you know, mm -hmm. because if, once you, you, you know, one department is not doing something and it's related to something else, it, it, it affects everybody. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to, for, you have employees there, they have the potential to be good employees, but they're yeah. not meeting up to the expectations, you know, how would you handle that from mm -hmm. your perspective? Well, I think I think I ought to talk about a couple of the other areas of a culture of excellence because it speaks to that specifically. We've okay. already talked about strong leadership and we've talked about empowering communication. Those are two of yes. the elements of a culture of excellence. Right. The other one is clarity and focus. Mm -hmm. uh, that The organization has a plan. They know where they're going as an organization. Each department within that organization knows how they contributed to that plan and, and what aspects of that plan do they own. And yeah. every individual knows where they plug in as well. Yes. The, the, the third element, fourth element. So we've said strong leadership, empowering communication, clarity and focus. Two other elements I want to talk about are engaged and committed teammates. Yes. And so, you know, disengagement means so. So disengagement means when someone quits and leaves or quits mm -hmm. and stays rather. Right. Yes. Quit, they quit and leave. That's a retention issue. Disengagement yeah. is when they quit and stay. They just don't tell you that they've quit. They just stop doing right. their job. Right. Right. Disengagement, employee disengagement is one of the single greatest uh, expenses hitting companies today. They have too many people to do the job that they should do with a lot fewer because of disengagement. So yes. looking to to make the work meaningful, uh, to connect them with the work, and also being willing to give them feedback about their contribution, even if that feedback is negative. Mm -hmm. And then the 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 fifth aspect is 100% accountability. That is one of the prime elements of a culture of excellence is 100% accountability from the top office to the to the newest employee. And right. what that what that looks like is when I commit to you that I'm going to deliver something to you by noon on Thursday. Yes. Then I'm going to deliver 100% accountability says I'm going to deliver that to you come hell or high water. Now, right. If something happens on Tuesday that was unplanned, that takes me off track, at the very first moment that I realize that, I come to you and I say, Stacy, I know I committed to you to do this by noon on Tuesday. Is that a drop dead date for you, drop dead time for you? And you may say, it absolutely is because I have a client meeting at two o'clock. Right. And I say, okay, then I'm going to have to reprioritize because I've had some distractions come on board. Right. 
you might say, no, you know what? Don't worry about it. I, I'm not probably not going to look at it until Monday. I'm going to say, okay, great. But the point is the very first moment that I realize that I am at risk at not doing what I said I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it, 100% accountability means that I actually come to you and attempt to maybe negotiate a change. What I don't do is wait until Friday morning until you ask me about it. And then I say, oh yeah, I never got a chance to do that. Right. So yeah. at its core, if, if integrity is defined as doing what you say when you say you're going to do it, if integrity means your words and your deeds are aligned, then accountability is really an integrity issue. Yes, very true. Very true. So what I like to do when I'm having an employee who I think is a good employee, they are a cultural fit for the organization, but maybe having some bad habits or maybe demonstrating some undesirable behaviors, I like to give them what I call feedback without fallout. Mm -hmm. uh, feedback without fallout. And that's a model that I use that was actually uh, done with me when I had someone who worked for me for a period of time. She came to me one day and said, Jeff, can I give you some feedback? And I said, sure. And she said, what I'd like to do is tell you what I'm observing. I'd like to then uh, uh, sh share the, the impact that it's having, how it's made me feel and the impact it's having. Then I'd like to give you a chance to respond and maybe we can talk about a resolution. Now, keep in mind, this was an employee that worked for me. Wow. And, uh, and so I, I thought about that and I, I turned around and I said, yeah, sure, please, please give me, give me that feedback. And she said, well, first of all, I, um, when, when I come in to meet with you on a weekly basis for our regular touch base and I'm sharing with you project status and where I'm having struggles and where I'm having bottlenecks and where I need support, I begin to observe a tilting of the head, a glazing over of the eyes and a frequent checking of the watch. Oh. That makes me feel like my job's not important. It makes me feel like I'm not a valued member of the team and it makes me want to look for a job somewhere else. The impact that it's having is I have floated my resume and I have two interviews, one this week and one next week. Now I'd wow. like to give you a chance to respond. <laughs> of course, um, my immediate was re response was, I am so sorry. I, yeah. I, I'm humiliated because that's not the behavior that I want to demonstrate. Right. I had no idea I was doing that. Yeah. I can't promise you I'm going to change that tomorrow and you'll never see that happen again because clearly it's a bad habit that I've created. But what I can promise you is you have my permission to call that behavior out every single time you observe it and to not let me do that. That was the only way I knew how to respond, right? So I've, I've taken that, that concept of what she did and I, I have formalized that into a model that I call feedback without fallout. And it has been very useful for me, you know, and, and so that model looks something like this. Number one, I always, if I'm getting ready to have a tough conversation with someone, I, I try to put myself into a mindset of when I walk out of that conversation, I want to leave them thinking more about their behavior or their performance than they are thinking about my behavior. Right. And so I need to leave them feeling empowered to handle that. Even if I have to give them some tough feedback, I want that conversation to be empowering communication where they walk out feeling stronger and more confident versus weaker and less confident. And so right. how did this woman do this for me? Number one, she planned ahead. She knew exactly how to have that conversation and she, act, she created an agenda. Mm -hmm. The second thing that she did is she got my permission. May I give you some feedback to which I said, of course. So she got my permission. Had I started rebutting her or 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 breaking in and trying to 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 steer the conversation, she could have said, "Now, now wait a minute, you gave me permission." Right. She owned the agenda, and she got yeah. my agreement to the agenda. Had I tried to take us off track, she could have said, "Now wait a minute, it's it's not your turn in the agenda yet." Right. Mm -hmm. She spoke factually, or at least observationally. She said, "I observe." When I come in here, I observe this, I observe this, and I observe that, and it makes me feel this way. Yes. Um, she she used I messages versus you messages. If she had have said, you do this and you do that, that's very accusatory. I could have said, no, I don't. Right. She, had she said, you always or you never, I would have even argued louder, right? So she stayed away from those 
emotionally charged accusatory words. And she said, I observe this. I observe that. It makes me feel this way. It makes me feel that way. She spoke only for herself. She didn't speak for everyone else. She could have come in and said, everybody on the team thinks that you do this, right? And I could have said, well, don't tell me about everybody. Tell me about you. So she literally took away all of the arrows that I had, totally disarmed me, gave me feedback in a manner that I had nothing. There was no potential response other than a constructive response. Wow. I am very impressed with that employee. Actually, that that is the perfect way to, when you have an issue, any type mm-hmm. of issue, mm-hmm. to approach another individual. Even in your personal life, you could mm-hmm. take that, you can take that, you know. For sure. um, Marriages uh, and parenting relationships. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and, and that's a great way to communicate with another individual. You're not mm-hmm. accusing them. You're speaking for yourself. You're getting permission. And you are, you're, you're, you're getting out the problem and yeah. you're, you know, and you're able to communicate and you're not, you're not bringing in anything else. You're just talking about yourself. And these are my feelings. And mm-hmm. these are saying that, you know, it's okay for me to feel like this. I'm allowed to feel like this. This is the way I feel, you know, mm-hmm. may I have your feedback, you know, yeah. and that, that to me is like the perfect way to communicate with any individual. If we all communicated like that with our workers in our family homes, you know, at, in, in the streets with, with other people, mm-hmm. you know, relationships, friendships, businesses would, would, would excel just, just sure. by that agenda. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's been transformational for me when I when I use it, right? Remember I said earlier, the biggest competitor to a change is, is the status quo. And sometimes yes. I still am who I am on the inside and I forget to do that. But but even that point number one, that I want to leave them thinking more about their behavior or their performance than they're thinking about my behavior. Even if I just do that, it yes. puts a different frame of reference to have that difficult conversation. So when I talk about empowering communication and I talk about leadership and I talk about engaged and committed teammates, I don't want to suggest that leaders don't have to have tough conversations sometimes because they do. Leadership is not a popularity contest. And, no. and sometimes you have to have a tough conversation with an individual because they're abusing the system, they're abusing their other teammates. And if you have a set of core values that you've adopted as an organization, if you're not willing to hire and fire people against those core values, then they're really not core values. They're just pretty words on a page that you put some graphics around and stuck on the wall. Wow. You know what? That is, that is amazing. You know, I, I, I I think that you know, everything you just said right now is such such valuable input for any business, no matter what size, you know, it's, it's a great way because communication is key, you know, and, yeah. you know, leadership, like you said, is a very difficult, you know, uh, position to be in, you know, but how mm-hmm. you handle it, how you communicate and body language is a huge part. And a lot of times, most of the time we don't realize our body language when we speak, but right. our body language tells everything. And, mm-hmm. you know, you can say one word, and you could say, you can say, you could be talking and you could be saying X, Y, and Z, but if your body is, body language is doing something else, you That's know, right. it, it means like, I have to say this because I know it's going to please you, but this is how I really feel. And That's there right. have been many, many people have, have done presentations about it because the way you shake a person's hand, the way you look a person in the eye, the way you, mm-hmm. you hold yourself, you know, that speaks louder than, than the verbal, you know, words that we yes. express another human you know so re- yep. really it, you know by knowing how your facial expression looks you know how you your eyes look glazed and you tilt it mm-hmm. to the left and you mm-hmm. know that that brings awareness to you and that actually could you know like you said strengthen relationship between sure. another place. so i like that a lot you know you said a few moments ago that that employers having a hard time finding employees or keeping employees and and i want to share an anecdote with you but i want to say first and foremost if If you haven't really taken a look at the culture of your organization and you're having a hard time finding or keeping employees, that'd be the first place that I would look. I've got some research from Forbes, from Gallup, from Columbia, uh, uh, four times the revenue growth of company strong companies with strong cultures have four times the revenue growth of companies with weak cultures. They have higher profitability. They have higher customer satisfaction and retention. They have they have lower healthcare cost. 
uh, companies with weak cultures or negative cultures have three times greater employee attrition. Uh, they have they have less productivity. In fact, the the for companies that have weak cultures, their employees are costing them thirty four percent more than companies who have uh, uh, strong cultures. And and so I want to share an anecdote with a company that I'm actually an investor in, but I also do some consulting work with as well. It was an insurance agency, uh, an insurance agency that has three locations. And about three years ago, we started working with them to create a strategic growth system. And, and when they started thinking about the vision of their company three years down the road, they put an equal focus on their customers as they did their employees. And, and their vision was something like this. By 1231, 2027, we will be the agency of choice for insurance professionals to thrive and for customers who need high quality insurance products and solutions, right? right? So they said, we want to be the employer of choice for insurance professionals, and we want to be the insurance provider of choice for, for people needing insurance solutions. At that time, three years ago, they had more open positions than they had talent to fill. Okay. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't, they couldn't fill their, their positions. Right. They consciously and deliberately started working on choosing better talent, choosing talent with, that was aligned with the core values of the organization, creating uh, empowering communication to help that talent thrive, creating systems of accountability to ensure 100% accountability and all the other elements of that culture of excellence. Within the last six months, uh, they have seen a complete flip where they have they are they have more people coming to them looking for positions than they have positions to fill. And so they wow. now have a waiting list of top candidates that they've already interviewed and they've said, hey, look, you're somebody that we want to work with us. We don't have a job right now, but we're rapidly growing. We think in the next three to six months we will. Before you take another job somewhere else, call us back because you're number one on our list, right? And as a result of that, uh, they're growing more than 25% per year uh, across their three locations and and have more employees, more highly talented employees than they've ever had before. Wow, that's amazing. That shows you how important culture mm -hmm. really is. Because you know what? Some people may not recognize how important culture is and they may overlook it. And, you know, they're worried about all the other things that we have talked about previously in our conversation. And culture is is really a valuable aspect of the company, Agreed. you know, it's a, it's the solid foundation that brings, you know, brings the company to higher growth and prosperity and mm -hmm. brings them to, you know, reach the goals that they've, you know, they, they, have you know, uh, formatted and, and created for themselves. So, 100% for sure. For sure. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, with your consulting, like, what are some of the um, things that you do with companies when you consult? And is there are there common problems and 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 some solutions you like to share, or maybe some techniques and strategies that you have sure. that share? Yeah. So, so everything that we do as a consultancy is focused on helping organizations and their leaders achieve sustained strategic growth. Uh, and we do that in the areas of innovation, strategy, profit growth, uh, organizational effectiveness, leadership. Um, so so when we go in, we spend a lot of time on the front end of the engagement, uh, helping the helping facilitate with the leader, the CEO and the executive team. You know, what are the challenges that that you've experienced that have been impediments to growth? What's keeping you from growing? Uh, and in some instances, we find that that they're just not innovating enough. Other instances, it's because they've they just don't have a plan. Uh, right. Other instances, it's because uh, they actually um, they actually have tapped into uh, or, or kind of have tapped out, if you will, on the ability to grow organically, and they need to make some acquisitions. Um, and and so we help them figure out what are the major impediments and build solutions around those impediments to overcome them to create sustained strategic growth. So we may run an innovation sprint with them for a couple of days. 
Uh, next week, I've got two clients that are in uh, Monday and Tuesday from Chicago. Uh, and then on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I'm with a, a client up in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, which is the Walmart headquarters uh, city where the Walmart headquarters is. And uh, I'm at varying stages of working with them. One client, the first client, it's about a $50 million organization. And, and when we first started working with them, we have a, a growth diagnostic we call the Growth DX. Uh, yeah. And it's www.growthdx.ai. And it basically helps them identify how their company is performing against a set of 75 best practices that are known to contribute to strategic growth. And so when when we did the Growth DX with this first company back in January, uh, that led to a, a full 12-month engagement uh, that was could be described as nothing more than a than an organizational transformation initiative. Uh, we have we have restructured the entire organization. We've put new people in the top five leadership executive seats in the company. We've built out a multi-year, three-year gr strategic growth plan. Yeah. Uh, we have helped them launch a search for a new CEO. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the meeting Monday and Tuesday is the very first meeting with this newly appointed executive team. And, uh, and we're finalizing the strategic growth plan that we started on uh, about three months ago and, uh, and then resolving a number of issues that have been identified in the process. Uh, wow. and, and so they're all flying in from various uh, locations around the, around the country. Uh, the one on Friday, on, on Wednesday, Thursday, rather, is, is our, 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 we, we helped them actually execute an acquisition. They acquired a company that was about almost the same size as, as they are, probably about 70% of their size. So they almost doubled in size overnight. And wow. uh, this acquisition uh, actually uh, occurred March the uh, April the 1st. And so we spent January to March getting ready for the acquisition. We The transition clo transaction closed on April the 1st. So we spent April, May, and June really kind of trying to do the integration. Yeah. And so uh, we now have a newly appointed leadership team. And we're now going to spend two days focused on what is the strategic direction of this newly acquired and newly combined merged organization. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. I have another organization that's actually here and it's walking distance to their company. They're another, they're probably a $40 million company. Uh, they're in the network of, of fiber and broadband space and um, growing very, very rapidly. They'll probably grow a hundred percent this year. And, but they're a relatively new company yeah. and uh, we've already helped them create their strategic growth plan, but we've observed some deficiencies in leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done an, uh, a, a company-wide survey to, to kind of get an idea of the culture of the organization. Yes. And so this morning I put in front of them some recommendations for how we can do some leadership development uh, for mm -hmm. both their executive team and their middle ma managers to address some of the issues that were identified in the, um, in the uh, culture assessment that was done. Wow. I like that. That's, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Now, you know, with everything that we've talked about today, if you had to um, give about three or four takeaways and emphasize on some important aspects, mm -hmm. what are some things that you'd like the, the listeners to understand and, and focus on that you think have a powerful effect on their businesses if they focus on it? Yeah. The, the first one that I would say is back to that definition of leadership, that it is the most important requirement for business and personal success. Uh, in simple terms, it's defined as the willingness to be held accountable for results, no matter what else is going on. Right. So that's kind of number one. Number two, I would say that leadership requires a very delicate balance as well. And that is a balance between results and relationships. If I focus on results at the expense of relationships, I will be wildly successful very, very quickly uh, until I alienate everyone around me who's responsible for helping me maintain those results. Yeah. If I focus on relationships, but on the other hand, at the expense of results, people will love me. They'll love going to lunch with me. They'll love spending time with me until they lose respect for me because I can't do what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. Right. Um, and, and, and so I have to really walk that tightrope between the two. The third takeaway, I would say, as, as, as a leader of the organization, uh, if you are not in, a, in tune with what the culture is of your organization. And, and, and culture really is everything about your organization. It's, 
It's the core values and shared beliefs. It's the unwritten norms and operating principles. It's, it's how people view their work and how they view each other. It's how they feel when they come in. It's how they feel when they go home. And, and I don't want to suggest that culture is a bunch of fluff because it's not, but if you as the leader are not in tune with your culture and you're having a hard time hiring or retaining, recruiting and retaining employees, then you better get in tune with your culture uh, because it may be the absolute stranglehold on your company that you're just not aware of. Right. Oh, I agree so much. Those are great takeaways. Those are great takeaways. Now you have two websites. Can you mm-hmm. repeat the website so people can remember them and click sure. on to them? We'll put it in the description box also, but I'd like you to just, you know, say it out loud. So they, they absolutely. Know. The first one's jeffstandridge.com, uh, www.jeffstandridge.com. The second one is innovationjunkie.com, innovationjunkie.com. And then I can be reached out to directly on LinkedIn. I'm very active out there. And I, I will just, um, go ahead and offer, uh, I have a couple of things that folks are interested in. If they're interested in a free 30 minute coaching call with me, uh, no strings attached, no ask, uh, on the back end to be happy to do that. Number one. And number two, if they want to go to growth DX, uh, dot AI, uh, that they can actually get there from innovation junkie, but it is our strategic growth diagnostic. Be willing to offer a free growth diagnostic for anybody who's interested as well. If they have a company of, of a certain size. Oh, great. Now, can you also tell people about some of the services that you provide so they know? Sure. Uh, so we do strategic growth planning, the the creation and implementation of a strategic growth system. Uh, as a result of, of actually implementing that strategic growth system, we, we often find that our CEO wants our advisory services, which is direct coaching and consulting to the CEO and or many of his direct reports, his or her executive team. Uh, uh, we run innovation sprints where we help companies that are thinking about new products and services or a way to really disrupt the status quo in their business. We run uh, either one day or multi-day uh, innovation sprints with them. Uh, and and then just our, our general advisory services where we have a conversation, we find out what's going on with them, and we, we come to that point of need and actually construct a c- custom solution, be it sales effectiveness, uh, be it profit uh, improvement or or what have you. Excellent. Wow. You, you do. Like I said, you wear a lot of hats and you're, you're absolutely phenomenal. And your advice today was phenomenal. I really so much. enjoyed this conversation. You really tapped into a lot of different areas today, but they're important areas and they're, they're, they are a must for a successful business company, corporation, no matter what size you are, the principles you went over today are things that every one, every entrepreneur, every business, every corporation should have in order to succeed and grow to their expectations. And today's information that you provide was so valuable. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time out to express all this information to us and to be able to share it with our listeners. And you are just phenomenal. So I just well, thank want to you. say so much thank for you. your time. Stacy, thank you so much. And I appreciate the work that you do with, uh, with entrepreneurs and professionals and business owners as well. Um, you know, I, what people don't understand is that small businesses and entrepreneurs account for 99% of all employers in the United States, 50% yes. of all employed, and they're responsible for the vast majority of job creation. And yeah. so the work we do, we're doing the Lord's work here. So I appreciate your contribution to that as well. Oh, thank you so much. And I appreciate you and everything that you do as well. Thank you for coming on the show. I hope to have you back and just, just thank you for everything. You, oh. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. You as well. Call me anytime. It's been a pleasure. I, I will. Thank you. Bye-bye.